What's up, I'm Ujemma, and welcome back to my channel. Before we get into the video, I just want to say thank you so much for a thousand subscribers. It's actually incredibly wild that we've made it to this point, but I'm glad that there's a thousand people out there who have been finding my videos interesting. Thank you for everyone who's been watching, liking, sharing, doing the whole shebang. I really do appreciate it. And for 2021, I only hope and pray that this channel continues to grow, that we connect with more people. I'm able to create more videos that help everyone out there, and it's just a great community. So with all that, I want to say again, thank you so much and let's get into this video. So for this video, I actually wanted to talk about generating API keys or developer tokens. I've never worked on an API as long as I have for the Evo API, so I never reached the point of having to ask more security focused questions of how do I protect the API, how do I keep track of who's making so many requests to the API, etc, etc. So as I was performing research to figure out what the best solution was for generating API tokens for this API, I was actually surprised that there weren't a lot of helpful guides, articles, or videos out there for the specific situation that I was in. Luckily, I came across a video who walks through the whole process of actually generating developer tokens and assigning those tokens to specific users so they have access to the API. So after watching this video, at a very high level, I started to conceptually understand what I wanted the API to achieve. When a developer creates an account and they provide their email, their name, and a password, they're going to be automatically sent back a generated API token, which they will associate with their application. So anytime they wanted to make a request to the API, they would have to send along their API token so they can be granted access to the words and examples in this API. So this means if there's a bad actor who's trying to take down the API, we can rate limit them or just totally disable their API keys so they don't have access to the API anymore. So I'm gonna walk you through the solution that I came up with as a very base level for keeping track of developer tokens for the Evo API. For the whole flow of creating a developer account and generating API tokens, I created an extra endpoint called developers. This extra endpoint lives inside of the router.js file. So you can see here, whenever any user makes a post request to the developers route, we pass it to this route. So we have a couple of middleware before we hit the final function that's responsible for actually creating developers and generating API keys. We pass it through a number of middleware to make sure that the requests that are coming to this route are valid. So for the first middleware, it's a rate limiter. So since the post developer's endpoint is open to the public, we want to keep track of the IP addresses that are making requests to this endpoint. If we notice that IP address is making a crazy amount of requests to the same post developer's endpoint, we're going to rate limit them and say you have to wait to make another request. But if you're able to get past the rate limiter, we validate the developer body, making sure that the information that's provided from the client side is valid shape. We can take a closer look inside of this middleware, but what's happening inside of here is we're expecting the data to come from the client side to include an object, and the object should have the following keys, which is name, email, password, and host. So these are the four pieces of information that are required in order to create a new developer account. If you don't have any of these pieces of information, you're going to get a 400 response saying that one of these keys is required. So assuming that the client provided all the required information, we finally make it to the final function, which is responsible for creating developer accounts. So inside of our post developer function, we are first grabbing hold of the data that's coming from the client side, and then we're spreading out the email, host, password, and name, which was provided by the client. With this information, what we first want to do is look inside of our database to see if a developer already exists with the provided email that came from the client side. So if we get any developer returned back from this call by searching by email, we know that a developer is already using that email. So we're going to return an error back to the client saying that the email is already used. But if the user provided a completely unique email, then we can move on to the next part of the function. So the first thing that we're doing is generating the API key. This is actually the API key that we're going to pass over back to the client side and what they're going to use to validate all of their requests whenever they want to interact with the API. But what we want to do for security purposes is avoid saving this API directly in our database. So if the database ever got breached, there wouldn't be any possible way for the bad actor to be able to grab all the developer API keys. So the way that we end up keeping track of API keys without actually saving it inside of the database is through hashing. So when I generated my API key, I passed that key inside of my hash function. So the first thing that's happening in this function is me defining the algorithm. We're using a SHA-512 to make sure that the final hash value is extremely hard to decrypt. And after that, I use a secret token. The secret token is used in partnership with the value that I provide in order to create the hash value. 
In order for me to decrypt this hash value, I need to have the value, which is the user's API key, and the secret key, which is stored inside of the API in a secret location. To have a better idea of what's being saved inside the developer's secret variable, we can go inside of our config file, and we can see that first we're looking inside of our environment to see if we set the developer secret to a value. But if you don't have developer secret inside of your environment, we just fall back to developer underscore secret for local development. After I have those two values, I use the node crypto package to be able to create a new hashed value of my API key. So I assign the algorithm, provide the secret token, and then I generate the hash value with my provided API token, and then I digest it in hex. This is now the hashed version of my developer's API token. Then after that, I also want to avoid saving the developer's password inside of the database, so I also hash that value as well. Next, I flatten the list of host values that come from the client side. Host is just a list of valid host names for your application. So if your application's website name is myapp.com, you want to provide myapp.com inside of the host field so the database can keep track of which applications are allowed to use the API key. After I have all this information, I create a new developer document inside of my MongoDB database. If I take a closer look at my developer schema, I can see that I'm expecting a name for the developer, an API key, which is the hash value, the email for the developer, the hashed password, an array of hosts. I also keep track of the usage metadata for this developer account. So inside of this usage object, I keep track of when the key was last used, and then how often that key has been used for that given day. So once I create a new developer, I save that developer to my MongoDB database. And then I perform a check to see if I'm not inside of my testing environment. I actually want to send an email to the new developer with their API key, along with just their name to make the email more personalized. So the structure for generating API tokens comes directly from Griffith's video. So I highly recommend going over there and watching his video because he has extra information on different ways you can approach the solution. But this worked best for the Ebo API. So once all that's done, I return a message back to the client side saying that an email has been sent to the developer's email. And that's how you generate an API token. So let's see how this works with the API. So locally, I'm going to start my MongoDB database by doing a yarn start database. Then I'm going to build my application just to make sure that everything's spelled correctly. Then after that, I'm going to start the built version of the API. So if I go to localhost 8080, I can see the homepage for the application. And now we can see a new button that says register for an API key. So I'm gonna provide my full name, my email, password, which is password in this case, and then I'm gonna provide my project domain name. Then I'm gonna create my account. So the way that it works is that if everything goes smoothly, you should see the success check your email button pop up. This means that the information, like your API key, has been sent via email. We can also see inside of the MongoDB instance that's running locally on my computer, I have a new developers collection that popped up. We can see inside of the database, I'm keeping track of my name and then I have my email. Along with that, you can see that I have my API key and my password inside of the database, but these are the hashed values of my developer account. So for the API key and the password, they're hashed values. So as you saw with me signing up for my new account, I just typed in password for my password, but inside the database, it's a hashed value. So if there is a bad actor who was able to get this information inside the database, they wouldn't really know the password for that developer, nor would they know the developer's API key. And if I go inside of my Gmail account, you can see that a new email has been sent to my account. It says, welcome, Ijama. You can view your API key below. Remember to save this API key and keep it completely private. And you can see this is the actual API key that you would want to use inside of the API. I'm going to keep this video short by ending it here, but in the next video, it's going to be more of like a part two to show you how you can use these API keys to authenticate developers so they can have access to resources for an API. So the basic idea for this is if a developer provides a valid API key, then they would be able to access all the words and examples in the Ebo API. But if there was another type of request with an invalid API key or no API key at all, then 
they shouldn't be able to see anything from the API. So that's it for generating API tokens. It took me a while to wrap my head around this concept and I think I learned best when I see concrete examples. So I really do appreciate the video from Griffith because it really just helped get all these ideas that were in my head working inside this application. So I recommend watching that video if you want even more details. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Again, thank you for the 1000 subscribers. I'm so hyped for that. And I'm really excited about making more videos. Let me know if you have any questions about how to generate API tokens. If you want to see a different type of video or just anything about JavaScript, let me know down in the comment section below. I'm also on Twitter where you can send me a DM asking me questions about JavaScript or about the Ebo API and I would be happy to have a chat. Also, if you want to contribute to the Ebo API, I'm going to leave a link down to the GitHub repo and also a volunteer form. So if you are not a developer, but maybe you're a fluent Ebo speaker, or maybe you're a UI UX designer, or if you're a grant writer, if you're someone who's really interested in the PR, anything about anything, please, please, please look down in the description box and look at the volunteer form. I'm trying to get as many people to contribute to this project because I really truly believe that it can allow a lot of Igbo kids to learn their mother tongue. So please go down to the description below, share links. So with all of that, I will see y'all in the next video.